a city in flames, a ruler retreating to safety and looking out in dismay at the unrest around him. Not Trump running to his bunker today, but the young King Richard II in London in 1381, looking out from the Tower of London at the Peasants' Revolt. The Peasants' Revolt then was known as the Rising or the Great Uprising, and it happened quite simply because people had been pushed too far. They just survived a terrible pandemic, the Black Death. Up to 50% of the population of the country had been wiped out and ordinary people, peasants and serfs, suffered most terribly of all. They didn't know what was causing the disease. They didn't know if it was divine retribution or if they would survive. Most people then were peasants or serfs. Peasants had a bit more freedom of movement, but serfs were virtually owned by the landowner or the lord of the manor. They were forced to work in his fields. After the Black Death had wiped out in some villages up to 80% of them, the peasants and the serfs thought perhaps they could be helped by the supposed betters. They asked for higher wages, but this was made illegal. The king introduced the statute of labourers, which stated you could not even ask for higher wages. To make matters worse, the poll tax was then introduced in 1377. Everyone from the poorest serf to the lords paid the same. There was a sort of exception for girls over 15 who could prove they were virgins. What could possibly go wrong there? Well, what could go wrong, of course, was that tax inspectors used this to basically commit sexual assault, adding to the humiliation and anger of the poor. Things came to a head in May 1381 in the little village of Fobbing in Essex. The king's tax collector arrived to demand the villagers paid up, but they'd had enough. He was met by a deputation, including the local landowner, because it wasn't just the poor who were outraged at the inequality in the country at the time. They turned him away empty-handed. They were, if you will, fobbing him off. Of course, the government and the king could not stand for that flouting of their authority. And Richard sent in the soldiers. But before they could get to the village, they were stopped by an army of angry rebels. People came from Suffolk, Norfolk, Essex and Kent. They gathered at Blackheath, where they planned their next move and listened to speeches. Leaders began to emerge. One was Watt Tyler, who in fact was probably just Walter and was a Tyler because surnames weren't much in use in those days. It was generally your occupation that people used to describe you. Watt or Walter, it said, had a daughter who was raped by a tax inspector and that's why he became involved. Another prominent leader, John Ball, was a priest, but he had been in prison because he was a radical priest at Maidstone. On the way to Blackheath, the rebels broke him out of prison and the leader of that prison break was a woman, Joanna Ferrer. Joanna was described in later court records as the leader of all the evildoers from Kent which you have to say is pretty badass, isn't it? You wouldn't mind having that on a t-shirt. We know now that women were totally involved in the Peasants' Revolt, thanks to women historians like Sylvia Federico at Bates College. From Suffolk alone, there are references to 70 women rebels. At Blackheath, John Ball gave powerful speeches He asked the crowd when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? Meaning, we were all created equal at the beginning. Ball believed that his God did not want this inequality between rich and poor, that it was oppression 
and that people should throw off the yoke of oppression and fight for their liberty. In London, the rebels went straight to the palace of the hated John of Gaunt, one of the young king's senior advisers and his uncle. His beautiful Savoy palace was looted, his finery and treasures thrown into the Thames. Luckily for him, he was away from home, so his life was spared. His family and servants were allowed to go, they were not harmed. The leader of this, as well, was our Joanna Ferrer. This isn't actually her, of course, but it's a learning assistant at Norwich Castle, dressing up as her. Finally, the king realised he was going to have to meet with the rebels. That's what they were demanding, because they trusted him. They thought he was potentially just and that he'd listened to their concerns. He immediately told them he would. Just like that, he said he would end serfdom and the poll tax. They hadn't blamed him for the poll tax, but Simon Sudbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was the architect of it. And while most of the rebels were listening to the king and starting to disperse, those who were still in London, unfortunately for Simon Sudbury, found him and they executed him. They blamed him for the poverty and oppression that had been wrought on them. The king heard about this, spent the night hiding in terror, but the next day agreed to meet the rebels again. This time, things went very differently. The Lord Mayor of London, William Woolworth, suddenly drew his dagger, pulled Wat Tyler from his horse and stabbed him in the neck. Tyler was dragged away to St Bartholomew's Hospital before most people knew what had happened. And the king acted so quickly, it makes you wonder if it wasn't planned. He led the crowds away saying, I am your king, follow me. You know, don't nothing to see here. Don't look over there, look at me. And again told them he would grant all their wishes. He gave them papers to that effect and satisfied that their monarch had listened to them, they started to go home. Things were not so good for poor old Wat Tyler. Although he was taken to hospital, it wasn't to cure him. They beheaded him with the knife that was embedded in his neck. The villagers started making for home. They went back to their villages. But the king broke every promise he'd made them. He sent his soldiers after them. Villagers were dragged from their huts and cottages and houses. They were executed. John Ball was found, dragged in front of King Richard, told to go back on his revolutionary beliefs. He refused to do it. John Ball was hung, drawn and quartered. His body was displayed around the country, the parts of his body, the quarters of his body, and his head was taken back to London and put on a spike on Westminster Bridge. People eventually carried on with their normal way of life. What choice did they have? They went back to their fields. The lords thought they had completely reasserted control over them. They suppressed this dangerous revolution. But you can never really put that spirit back in the bottle. And whenever they could, peasants and serfs still fought for better wages and conditions. And they were often successful simply because repeated epidemics wiped out so much labour power. The lords had to sometimes give in just to keep their fields being worked. And what of our Joanna Ferrer? Well, Unlike a lot of the leaders of the revolt, she was never caught, never captured, never convicted. I'd like to think she lived to a ripe old age, reflecting on her past as the chief evildoer. What we learn from this is that you cannot repress and oppress people too much, too far, for too long, before they will start to fight back. You can only go so far. You can only crush people 
under your heel or under your knee for so long before they rise up and demand justice. In other words, as we're being shown again today, pride, even the greatest pride, very often comes before a fall. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this. Please click subscribe.